quick question for all of you. Why do they call it ancient? Why did Calhoun say the ancient relation? Yeah. Yeah, so they, it didn't take long for them to think it's natural, so that was part of it. What's the other thing? You wanted to create the idea that we've always done it this way. Yeah, so you combine those two things. It seemed like it because it's been there for over 100 years, and it's ancient, like it's always been this way, going back to the ancient Egyptians. But no, slavery was not based upon color or skin, and it was almost always more like indentured servitude. doesn't mean it wasn't horrible and there weren't slave codes. That's not the point. The point is this is relatively new. So that's why he set this up and the people are like, yeah, you know, it's been kind of like it's always been this way. And that's why I really emphasize that when I talked about, do you remember, what was that idea called from the Industrial Revolution, where women have a special purpose, where they're kind of noble and above the, yeah, they call it the domesticity. That was new. For most women, they worked shoulder to shoulder with the rest of the family to survive. But then that became, that's the traditional path. So that's why I wanted that question. We went through all the issue of deaf, dumb, blind, you kids, and insane. I do love the idea of trying to count insane people. No, I'm sorry, idiots. How do you count idiots? <laughs> I know, I like everyone starts pointing at each other. One, two, three, four. And yeah, I just made this up. But here's the big thing. So that's why I asked this question about, and, well, I'm reading through first periods. People doing really well on that little short ID. But that question about you know, what was the purpose of slavery? What, what was the benefit? A benefit? What was beneficial about slavery? The word disappeared. And I said, what about territories? So we went to this thing, slavery is so good. Slavery is such a good system that benefits so many people, especially the slaves, as we see by the, the dropping number of idiots. What does that have to do with territory? Yeah, we have from three different people, yeah. You got to spread to the territories. Remember the issue that led to the Civil War, slavery in the territories. And so we got to spread it. Why should we not spread it? It's the best system. Everybody knows their place. If you get rid of it, you have one group resort to crime. And what's vice again? Do you remember? Did I tell you vice, what vice was? Oh, I didn't tell you? I thought about telling you third period. Does that make you feel better yesterday? Than about yesterday? I, I really sincerely. Okay, so when you get rid of slavery, the former slaves immediately turn to crime and vice. So you've all heard the term vice. Vice is the name of a sin crime. It's a crime we deem it criminal because it is a sin. So let's put this up here. So maybe jot this down somewhere. Vice. The pins run out of ink, so I gotta use it only in special occasions. For vice. Vice is a crime that, okay, for whatever reason we deemed as, as being sinful and we made it illegal or put restrictions. I'll give you an example like drinking, you know, the restrictions, drugs, a prostitution, gambling. We go through a number of things like that. They're considered to be a sin. We've decided it's a sin. It's not directly somebody attacking somebody. Um, harming them or stealing from them. It's something more complex. And so big police departments to this day will have a vice squad. And the vice squad will you know, look for these kind of crimes. You're generally, you know, drugs are the biggie. Drugs are the biggie in, in the United States, but it's also gambling, other things like that. Um, so that's vice. And so it's almost like the idea is they can't help themselves. They're so unsafe. They're going to commit vice. And as we all know, those on top to Calhoun, this by color of skin, lighter kind of colored skin, they never commit vice. Never. It's only those inferior, lower people. Of course, that's not true. Out there, we don't, but out there. But the point is, they try to make it seem like that. He does. And he would not be alone. So I thought this was a really good article. We're going to get to this next one here in a sec. That Now it's a short one that we can do really fast, quick read and get to the main point. It sticks with the main point. He has now evolved it over two years, the positive good theory. So we got to the cotton gin. Oh, what was the rebellion? Just to kind of triggered like this wedge moment. Bacon. Bacon's rebellion. 
I know we have a few rebellions in here. We have Bacon, Whiskey, and Chase's Rebellion are the biggies we've had. Bacon's is the most important. Chase has led to the Constitution. Whiskey now showed we have a strong central government to put down the poor folk if they rebel. There's a crow out there. I saw a, uh, a kettle, small kettle of, uh, of vultures. Yeah, yeah because you know, when they circle, it kind of forms like, what's like a kettle? They circle. There's vultures everywhere. Yeah. There's a lot of vultures. Turkey vultures. When you go places where there's a lot of vultures, you see hundreds of them in a circle. Vultures are really cool until you look at one close. Okay, then they're not so cool. Let's talk about more birds. Oh no, it's limbo month. We got away. I say about uh, Oh, and then we have Bacon's Rebellion. We talked a little bit about getting rid of slavery. The cotton gin made it profitable. That's what we read. Here's the thing about cotton gin. Look how cotton production went up. 334,000 bales of cotton in 1820, 4.6 million bales of cotton. And you can really see significantly more land under the plow, more land, better methods of production, more pr um, and the cotton gin. Oh, and then, but the big thing is the cotton gin is not as important without the Industrial Revolution. You can turn that crank and put out a bunch of cotton, but it means nothing unless there's factories there to buy that cotton. They go hand in hand. So the cotton gin is not key, or is not that key to the, the growth of the importance of slavery until you have the Industrial Revolution. Speaking of that, this is actually not connected. We're ordering a new mouse and I have other really good news for you. We're getting rechargeable batteries. Whoa. See? Yeah. I know. So Flamingo Month will always be bright. So, we John mentioned Eli Whitney, that is from his original application for a patent. I just thought that was pretty cool. He actually stole it from somebody else. And we'll talk more about patents down the road. But here's the thing about it. The demeat to the man, and once this happened, slavery became incredibly profitable. All of a sudden now, diffusion went to a way to protect slavery, and everybody went to, we want to get rid of this system, to, we got to make money and not look back. So slavery is going to become really important. So that's why we read the defense of slavery. That should be in your head. This is all a way of going back in time for slaveholders and say, no, we started this as a good thing. Slavery. I don't know what I'm doing. Like This means going back in time. It's a way to go back in time and change what they did using hindsight to develop their philosophy today. It's a little like a conspiracy theory. And slave, and this would become then the cotton gin, and here are happy slaves who are out working around the cotton. Remember, slaves are being civilized, right? We got less idiots now. And so here is a famous picture of the cotton gin from the 19th century. And showing them, you know, the cotton, the master. But this is one of my favorite parts. He's overjoyed. Yay, I'm a slave. And as we all know, slaves like slavery. Until some people riled them up. Oh, here, this, I just stuck this in because I was looking for something else, but this is in a textbook. And it's showing how happy the slaves are. The cotton gin increased production. You can do the work of 100 slaves. Yay. Here's another one of happy slaves. Now, when I'm telling you this, think about what this is. That's from a textbook. That actually is a textbook from the 1960s. Doesn't this fit in almost exactly with what you just read with Calhoun? Implying this is good for slaves. When I was in college, I know what you're thinking. It was after the end of the Civil War. But when I was in college, and so I was at Rocky Mountain College, uh, we had a, a traveling professor. That's one of these small schools. Carol does it too. You think of these traveling professors that's coming for a year. I've been kind of bouncing around, hoping to get a job at business school. Whatever. Came in and he was kind of a joke. But um, he was talking to us and he was, I re remember he was also uh, a celebrant, whatever. 
But he, he was, it was American History Month, and he was telling us, mm -hmm. no, we got to get something through your head. Slavery was not that bad in the South. They treated the slaves well because they were too valuable. And anybody says they treated the slaves badly, they, they just don't know what was going on in the South before the Civil War. Slavery was just fine. Now, this was a college professor. He had a PhD. His name was Dr. Russell. And I'll never forget that, that slavery wasn't that bad. Almost exactly like he got all his training for the, um, his PhD from this. I stole yours. So let's get right to this. So what we have is the development of a single crop that came to dominate the South, King cotton. Yes, tobacco was still really important, but the, you could grow tobacco south of uh, North Carolina. And so this shows, and remember this, remember the amount of land, cotton swept westward. The darker, the uh, bigger band of cotton, more and more cotton, the great latitude for cotton growth. Yes, you get a little bit further north, but huge amounts of cotton there. And the area of thick, rich, black, dark soil called the Black Belt right here would be some of the biggest cotton production in the world to this day. And generically, this became down river. I've mentioned that before, but that's down river. It's just here. Everybody referred to the Mississippi, but it was all the Black Belt. And Virginia had a lot of slaves. You remember that's where tobacco cultivation began. But one of the biggest businesses for plantations in Virginia was to sell their slaves downriver. That became big money for them to sell them downriver, AKA the Deep South. And cotton production went up dramatically. So you notice this, let me show you another one. Here then you see where the yellow is, that's short fiber cotton, the one you had to pick apart, but now the cotton gin did it. Uh, tobacco, this weird middle latitude, the replantations not near as profitable. They would grow corn, wheat, and corn. Whenever you see corn production, it's almost like side by side corn, pigs, and the feed the cap, uh, the feed the soils. The sell the plantation, but that doesn't make as much money. I know they feed corn to cattle too, but it's actually toxic to cattle. That makes them really fat. That's why they pump them through a violence, which is yeah something I don't like to think about. But do you see where that is? See what the production is? Everyone see where the cotton is? All right, everyone take a good look at that. So let's look at the percentage of slaves. So the uh, the blue is the percentage of slaves as a population in each state. Remember, by census they counted the total number of people, and then they took the total number of slaves in each state, and what did they? Um, multiply it by three fifths. Yeah, the three fifths to give them the total towards representation. But they counted all the slaves. And look at this. This is 1860. Look at the percentage of slaves in the Black Belt. You notice that? Further north, you notice the percentage is not as high. And you can tell by just looking at this map. I know in the back of the class, it might be hard to see the numbers, but you can guess. Just look at it. What state seceded first? So, can't you see it? I mean, there's not even a doubt. Why is it most radical? The most slaves, the most slave owners. What's number two? Mississippi. Mississippi was number two. And then you're gonna have a big group of states coming together. And Texas, it was controlled by the slave owners, so they joined too. Texas was kind of an aberration, because remember, it's an independent country, just joined the union. And then, can you guess what state stayed in the Union and did not join the Confederacy? Tennessee and Arkansas were kind of split in half. In Tennessee, the eastern part of Tennessee actually wanted to secede and start their own and join the Union. They just about did. And that's exactly what West and the United States did a lot of that for West Virginia. They just couldn't quite get enough control of Eastern Tennessee. And this tells you everything you need to know. And one more thing. What's the greatest fear of slave owners? 
So we have political power, slave owners, and their greatest fear. That's the big one case. The slave owners have the most power in most states, and the greatest fear is slave rebellion. Wherever the percentage is higher. The slave owners, what are their fears? That's the political fears. I should add, can anyone guess which one of those states was the least democratic? The state that allowed the, um, had the most restrictions on voting. Yeah, South Carolina, because that's where the slave owners are the most fearful. They want to make sure that the non-slave owning people have no power to dictate anything about what they do with their slaves because they have the greatest fears. They also have the most invested, etc. You can tell right away. So what about the South? What that means is by seeing that there's no industry in the South. OK, there's a tiny bit. That's the Tredinger uh, Ironworks in Richmond, Vir Richmond Virginia. But they, there's money in the South. But money that would have went to capital, machines in the North went to slaves, went to land in the South. The excess money that the very wealthy had, they invested in land, they invested in slaves. So they, there's not extra money to buy the machines like the North. And why would they? The big plantation owners were cleaning up, at least for now. And so that's why they're anti-tariff. There's no industry to protect. Remember the nullification crisis? That is why Calhoun thought that would unify the South, because they don't have the factories. The factories are in Virginia, or I'm sorry, in Massachusetts. And one more thing. Remember way back when, when I showed you the railroads and showed you 1850, 1860, and all the railroad production in the North and not near as much in the South? Well, the money that came for a lot of those railroads came from states. They don't want a tariff. They don't want state taxes. And that's why they're anti-internal improvements. They don't want roads. They don't want canals because you got to pay for them. That means tariffs or maybe a tax on slaves. Now, you might be saying, well, how can you tax humans? They're enslaved people. They're bought and sold like any other product that's bought and sold, like a commodity. Do you remember? We've already had a big issue with a commodity that was taxed to pay back debt. Remember the whiskey tax and the whiskey rebellion? They could tax slaves. And so there's going to be intense anti-slave and therefore fearful government action. It's noticeable. Okay, Montana's kind of this weird aberration because no one lives here. We're huge in a million people. Just not a lot of people. And so we have massive government aid because we didn't no one could live here. It's gonna pay for roads because all the places that no one lives in. Make sense? But you see internal improvements, roads, canals, bridges in the north compared to the south. It's kind of startling. Especially in big cities in the north where there's subways and mass transit. They don't pay for it. The tradition has survived to this day. A lot more intensely anti government. Once again, Montana is this weird aberration. So, by 1860, almost 60% of all exports, all the value of it, was tobacco. Did I say tobacco? Yeah. I meant cotton. And look how the numbers went up 7.1% pre industrial revolution, just a tiny amount. It's dominating American exports. And so you can see this exports went up all through this era. Cotton exports went up too. It's the value of it. And like any other crop, it's going to be a lot of volume. It's going to be sold. A lot of volume. And, but here's the problem, as we saw. Production was going up this entire era. We could see production going up dramatically. This is by decade. The numbers, didn't, the numbers didn't come through. And here is the percentage of U.S. exports go up. The production went up. Remember, I talked about how more land is under the plow. But if production continues to rise, and you can imagine, especially early on, 
1840s, 1850s, when they started just cleaning up by selling their cotton to textile mills in Britain. And so we got to get every every square inch of ground that can have cotton, we got to plant cotton. And they're buying cotton. And that means we got to buy more slaves. And farmers are always in what? Yeah. Debt. So they got to pay for this. And everyone says, we got to just grow cotton, grow cotton. Gradually, what happens if you keep raising the supply of goods? You might get a bubble, but the price will go down. The price will eventually begin to drop. And you can see it here. So how do we figure out trend lines with price? Prices fluctuate for commodities up and down. So here's the, the fluctuation that they give the average trend line right here. And you notice the price per bushel is dropping. Oh, sure, they're selling a lot. But they got to sell more every year to make back the money they invested in the first place. Slowly going up. Now, what does that mean? That's the way the economy works. But can you imagine their feeling? We got debts to pay. Prices are dropping. What if there's any big threat to slavery? They're making money, but there's lots of insecurity. Lots of insecurity. What if they can't pay back their debts? What might happen if they stop the expansion of slavery? What might happen if there's a tax put on slave, the, in, the uh, trade, slave trade? What might happen if we get a free soil president? What might happen if we get a president who's really against slavery? We're already worried what might happen. And we already have Southerners freaking out about Missouri. Remember I told you how they freaked out about Texas and what state, what territory now, or what area wants to jump right in as a state, I pretty soon. Fort Kansas, California jumps right in what's going to happen and they just start freaking out and so what about the north well while this is going on what's happened to the north well all the industries in the north now it may not be the amount of wealth in the north but it seems like it look at the value of goods produced in the 10 years before the civil war 1.5 billion dollars compared to 155 million that's manufactured goods Here's railroads, 70% of railroads. Uh, 17 to one ratio of textiles. All the cotton in the South is either going to Britain or North. Firearms, 32 to one weapons made in the North. We can go on and on. But not just that, the banks are in the North. The population's in the North. It seems like the wealth of the North is growing faster, which it is. Now, in the South, they're making money. Remember, it's 60% of, their, of the exports. But they can look down the road and see, we're being swamped. The population of the North was more than double the population of the South by the mid-1850s, including slaves. That means the South has a tiny percentage of free people and a large group of the population of the South hate slavery. Oh, no, I forgot. Well, they, like slavery. They, yeah. they love it, according to Calhoun. But they begin to feel more and more like we're in the minority, which by population they were. The wealth, actually, there's a lot of wealth in the South, but it feels like they're not as wealthy. And when you're in the minority and feel like the majority can rule, can you imagine this dread? We let the North get away with anything. And the next thing you know, slave rebellion and or we lose our entire way of life. Have you ever heard of the slippery slope argument? That's what they're thinking this whole time. Slippery slope, we're going down. Once we start, we can't stop. And if they do this, and just imagine if they elect a free soil president. When will they elect a free soil president? Now, Lincoln was no abolitionist. It's free soil. So let's get a little bit about the culture. What's going on in the South? We talked about the economics. They're tied together completely. I should have left this off. This picture, now this is one of those. Look how happy the slaves are. What instrument is he playing, by the way? Yeah, yeah that's an African instrument. 
that came from Africa, adopt, um, made by by slaves, and then passed on. And it's it would be adopted by people all over. But yeah, well, it's very rural. There's hardly any big cities at all. I showed you that graph, graph before. And this shows the Virginia plantation in the 17th, 18th century, 19th century, generic plantation, even though it was like Monticello. But the South really, most of the people who lived in the South, free people were relatively poor farmers. And the plantation owners lived in luxury. They lived like, they're, they're trying to act like English gentlemen right here, but they acted like, they try to act like poor farmers too. They wanted that reputation. We don't have much wealth, we're just poor. Look at the North with the banks and the finance. But this was a myth. And this is a myth that's gonna be spread for years. Especially for anyone who's seen this classic movie called Gone with the Wind. But where was the wealth in the United States? So. Okay, this graph, can you see it? Can you see this chart from 1860? The per capita, which is the average income per household? Isn't that kind of startling? Where is the wealth? Connecticut's still one of the wealthiest states. There's a few southern states, because, you know, Florida Swamp and a few other ones. But look at the wealth. There is wealth there, but this is average wealth. Yeah, it's gonna be, if you get rid of the outliers, it's gonna be more accurate. I'll give you an example. They can come up with the average wealth of all of us right here, right? Right, we come up with a wealth. And then let's say Bill Gates, you know, Bill Gates is walking. What's gonna to happen to the average wealth of the people in this classroom? We all just got richer. Did we get richer? <laughs> okay, yeah, oh, trust me, he's getting richer. The wonders of finance. And who had the money? The big slave owners. A tiny percentage had the money in the South, but it was the big plantation owners. The more slaves you have, the more wealth you have. That's a pretty good chart. Yeah, Virginia. Yeah, New York was this aberration. What's the richest state today, by the way? Genetics in the top five, New York. In, yeah, the, the wealth in, in Manhattan. You know, people want to live in Montana is in the. Montana's 42nd. <laughs> yeah, if you go to Alaska. Yeah. But Alaska is an oil, oil wild. But yeah, that's for this total size of the economy. We're talking per household. When per household, we're in the 40. We're either 42nd or 43rd. I think it's 42nd if you count Washington, D.C., we're 43rd. If you count Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. would be, if you count that like an out of state, that'd be the richest per person. All right, so what we have in the South is a very stratified class system. Stratified means there are very strict classes and it's really hard to move up and down. And the way you showed wealth in the South was having slaves. You moved up. And so this is a really good one. This is all the people in the South, enslaved and free. 8% have five or more slaves. And a tiny percentage of that have the big plantations in the wild. And you see 8% of this have one to four slaves. Look at the vast majority of people. 50% of whites have no slaves. 2% of free African-Americans. And then 32, 33% were enslaved people. Now I should add, if slaves equaled wealth, and let's say you had something happen where you could start at the bottom and somehow got a little bit of wealth, what is the way you show your wealth? You made it, you're part of society. What do you have to do with some Buy slaves. So you're gonna have a lot, obviously a lot. Not that many overall, but there will be a number of former slaves to show that they're part of white society, therefore they can be trusted they will buy slaves. We'll purchase slaves. I made it, see? Remember way back on Monday, you had a quiz. And one of the questions was, who was a free African-American who was accused of trying to start a slave rebellion? That's yeah, that's Denmark Fessy. 
We also had Nat Turner, but that, that was a rebellion. Denmark, that's it. Hmm? No, that's Stephen. Well, that, that's not true. I understand. Well, how do you prove you're not going to start a slave rebellion and if you're a free African American and therefore won't be watched and harassed and maybe lynched? It's oh, nice. So that shows you how just corrosive this society was. Wealthy and slaves. Now, we have issues like that today. What do people do to, to show off their wealth? You know, they buy houses or cars or things like that, but here they're buying human beings. So, poor whites don't have much. Look at the percentage of slave holding families compared to total white families. It's pretty startling in every state, isn't it? And look at the percentage of um, people who had more than 100 slaves, the big wealth, 10 to 99. But we made it with the vast majority of people. But think about whites. It's very hard to move up and buy slaves. It's very to show you up well. It's very difficult to do that. So the vast majority of whites in the South are never going to have slavery. They're always going to be relatively poor. Laborers, maybe scratch farming a tiny little piece of land. But what's the one thing they have? Remember back to Bacon's Rebellion. They're white. They might not have anything, but who else is white? The big plantation owners, the big planters, even the majority of those, the vast majority who have slaves. I'm just like them, I'm white. And that gave them status. Status. And status would be key. I'm above. And if we get rid of slavery, what happens to that status? Start losing. Who would fight to defend slavery? The vast majority of the soldiers would be non slaveholding whites. They would fight to defend slavery. So that was the culture. I don't have much, but if we get rid of slavery, I'd lose my status. I don't have much, but if we allow blacks into our schools, I don't have much, but if blacks can vote. Now I'm talking about the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s and 1980s. And that was a lot. I'm older now. I feel older now. But, so we have a system of chattel slavery. They're owned as property by somebody. They're worked, and with the fornication laws and the slave codes, it is permanent slavery. Chattel slavery bought and sold at the whim of the owner, completely owned by them. Now, I know indentured servants were like that before when they're servants, but there's always this someday it will end and our children's a gray area, not anymore. And this is going to create a heck of a dilemma for slaveholders, a big dilemma. And what is the dilemma? It's really simple. We're making money. This system is benefiting me. And it's a carrot to put out the poor whites, saying someday you might get it. You're like me. Work the way I thought you do. We're torturing people to work them to death. We are sucking their very life to make money. Humans. We're using their blood to get rich and working them to death. The morality of that, especially for those in the second great awakening who are religious who are thinking, you know, I would like to go to heaven. Or the most basic, I want people to think that I'm a good person. How am I a good person when I'm literally torturing people to death? Because that's what slavery was. You see the moral problem? Money, it's working! What do you call this disagreement in your mind? Oh, do you remember? What was one of the rights in the Declaration of Independence that was freedom of conscience? What was that right? Oh, let's review. Now, you should know this by heart. What were the rights in the Declaration of Independence? All men are created, equal endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, which are? Which one was freedom of conscience? Liberty. Freedom of conscience was as far as your ability to take. Life is independence. Liberty, 
freedom of conscience. You decide, well, here's our conscience. We have a fight, an argument, two contradictory things. What do we call this contradiction? Cognitive dissonance. We all have cognitive dissonance. There are times, every single one of us will come up with a dilemma where if we do something, we know it might be immoral, but might give us short-term or long-term gain. Some kind of gain, or at least we think it will. And we know it's immoral, wrong, dangerous, whatever it might be. Every single one of us has had that issue. Now, we always choose the moral path, I know, in here. But out there, sometimes people don't. Like, for example, you're driving down the road and you're a little late for something, and there's nobody on the road, the speed limit is 25, and, you're, and you have that moral predicament, don't you? See, and, and a lot of you already decided, ah, yeah. damn morals, I don't care. I'm going to be dangerous. I'm going to risk other people if someone goes in the street. I'm going to be a dangerous driver and an impediment to the road to other people and drive 26. I know I'm being ridiculous, but if you drive 50, you know, that is really dangerous. And there's probably yahoos who have done that, not here. That's a simple one, isn't it? But every single one of you, and you have decisions about so many things in your life. And we can all come up with ones that we're not going to in class, but we all have that. We want to do something, quick gratification. We know it's immoral. It might be a problem for the rest of our lives. We can never get back. And we have this cognitive dissonance for so many things. We all have that. And we all made decisions on that. Sometimes the right one, sometimes the wrong one, but certainly not as consequential as this. At least I hope not. <laughs> and if you have one, I don't want to know. But how do you solve this? Well, if we're enslaving equals and treating them badly, we're going to hell. But what if they're not equal? What is it? Racism. It works so nice for this. Racism that is already developing would tie right in. They're inferior. We are enslaving and treating subhumans. So we're not really torturing equals. We're not working to death equals. And think about after Bacon's Rebellion. They set up laws that altered society in the way they think, and also, therefore, allowed wealth to pour. Yeah. You set up this system where you have laws. So society changed. Remember, we talked about people started changing, you know, dividing by color. And the economics, if you had slaves, you had wealth. All of a sudden, racism kind of started forming. And racism is relatively new. But now you could say you're, you're enslaving subhumans. Here is from a book by Hinton Helper from the 1850s. And this is one of the illustrated plates. And it's trying to show the benefits of slavery. Remember I showed you the picture of slaves when they got on board a slave ship and they showed them with like a coin cloth on? But what did that represent they really want? Yeah, they're naked. Same thing here. See? No, he did not have white shorts. So he's naked. Remember what makes us human? So it says the Negro in his own country and you notice out there just the wild, the savage wilderness. Did you see it? So what happened? I just killed him. There was a whole thing about cannibalism that was 99.9% .9 made up in Africa. There was cannibals all over the dark, savage continent. They're cannibals. That's what, if you leave them there, remember what Calhoun said they'll turn to vice and crime? Well, cannibalism, I think it's a crime. Should we go upstairs? Yeah. Is there a. Yeah. No, cannibalism is a You eat someone else too. Right? We're arguing cannibalism. Moving on. <laughs> don't, don't turn to cannibalism. Okay, if lunch is an hour. No, no, don't do it. So here's the Negro in America. This is, well, look at this. You notice them? What are they? They're clothed, they're civilized, they're sitting there in a house, not in the savage wilderness. Now, the one thing though, well, how do they get there? They're not alone. 
who helped them along the way? Do you see it? The master and mistress. And one more thing, the child. You notice how they're a little bit higher? You see the height? So the little above? And you notice the shading. Who's in the light of civilization? Who's still a little bit in the dark? You see the light? The child. The dark. The child. This is going to come out of imperialism and the slave trade. Light and dark. And so write this down. Dark is going to come to represent uncivilized. That's why they call Africa the dark continent. The lighter, more civilized. Doesn't that fit right in with the light? The lighter the skin, the more superior then. So you're going to see this in books, in plays, and then the first movies. What does the villain wear? What color? In the shadows. The heroes in white. I know we have like anti-heroes stuff like that, but it comes from racism, from slavery. And let's get to one more thing then. So. This is the ideology of the South. And ideology, which will be a justification. Now, this is what you have to write down for ideology. Everybody write this down for ideology. Ideology are your strongly held beliefs. Your strongly held beliefs that create your value system. Your strongly held beliefs that create your value system. And if you believe it, and they represent your values, if somebody comes up to you and says, no, you're wrong, and I have facts, what are you going to say? Sure, persuade me. No, what are you going to say? No! You're wrong. I know this is true. Remember Calhoun gave you some numbers? That was to reinforce what you already wanted to believe. And that's ideology. You believe it. It doesn't matter what anybody says. In fact, you get an argument with somebody who they have a strongly held belief on somebody, and the odds are no matter what you say, both sides would become even more strongly entrenched. I'm, no, I'm not changing what I believe. And you see this time after time after time. And you see ideology about, ideologies about a number of things. Like, for example, would be about we have ideologies about racism. We had ideology racism back then too, about slavery, about let's say abortion, um, women's rights, men's rights, uh, wealth, capitalism versus socialism. We find all kinds of ideologies. So this is the justification for slavery. And what is it doing? It is civilizing them. We're civilizing. We're doing them a favor. We're sacrificing. Remember that picture I just showed you? They'd be savages if not for us. We're civilizing. And this is very important here. They're under their watchful eye. Would you guys like some homework? Yes. Let me ask you again, and let's act like you really want it. Would you guys like some homework? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, someone still said no. $5.99 to 614 for Friday in America. Well, today's Wednesday. Huh? What about Friday? Well, we'll come you'll read it right before you come in. You'll you'll limbo in and we'll have the flamingo on. I don't know. It is Flamingo Friday, so you probably should have a quiz. It's also the first day of Limbo Month. We should do a Limbo Month. How dare they? They're lesser. Oh, there will be limboing on Limbo Month. And we're going to get to January, and you're all going to be saying, Can we Limbo? No. One month. It is sad, but that's, you know, that's what keeps us civilized. If we had too much of a good thing, we'd turn to spice. spice. <laughs> what was the show? Miami Vice. 
there was a TV show called Miami Vice about the Vice Squad, and their theme, it was so popular that their this, the theme song became the number one song. That's kind of weird, but yeah. It's it was a There we go. And on that happy note, one more day of November. Oh boy. Goodbye, everybody. Right when you find work, and hang by your thumbs. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. I'm looking at Denver. <laughs> it is a nice rug. Don't forget the rug, everybody. I know you can't, but. Never. I think about it all the time. It is a All the time. The rug? Yeah. It is. It's kind of nice. And it doesn't want you to want them. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared of it. Didn't like bite. Adios. See you tomorrow. Come on, Rob. I'm just flying away. Two more days of limbo month. Some people are not quite sure what I mean by limbo month. Oh, yeah, they'll find out. Yeah, actually making the episode.